non perturbative but then yes. you introduce uh, extra, perturbative extra. corrections yes, on top of yes. that it's one right. over n squared corrections right. that i did right. yeah right. right yeah which is like if you break it down into loop diagrams so you will right. get like six uh, six loop diagrams and wow. and, and okay. even more yeah yeah okay so yeah yeah it's it was a lot of uh, painful work you know painful in terms of uh, finding right. the divergences that's and, right yeah uh, keeping track of a lot of uh, yeah. uh, diagrams yes yes and i'm still interested in this uh, business of uh, uh, this uh, uh, Prasenta also, you know, this uh, uh, late stuff on the uh, semi-metal and vile, mm. vile metals, you know, mm. in relation to, uh, you know, scale symmetry breaking and the mm. chiral symmetry breaking, you know. Mm. So there is also some nice con uh, connections, you know, mm. with the, you know, with this, uh, you know, with the RG program as well, you know, because there too you have to find a beta function and so on. Right. Yeah, you. yeah. So I'll send you a paper that I did recently, and uh, yeah. maybe you can have some feedback and some ideas. Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. It uh, the the connection freezes at some point. It freezes. Yeah, probably, uh, but a bit more or less uh, okay. So you can we anyway get the YouTube. Uh -huh. So see that uh, then you would start. So yeah. So uh, it's a pleasure to uh, this thing to host uh, Professor Said Saki from uh, the American University of Sharjah. And uh, he's a condensed matter field theorist, uh, or shall we say, field theorist who enjoys working in condensed matter films. Uh, yes, it's at the interface between these two fields. Yes, yes. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the the connection is very, very. Uh, it's. Yeah, I think yeah. the connection from see that side is a little. Yeah, so yeah. That's right. So, so typically, I'm having a little bit of trouble with connecting yeah. from my side. So if yes. I if I log out at any point, I might actually get in from my mobile in, because okay. my broadband is giving trouble. But don't worry about me. Just get started. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, same thing on my side. In case I have any technical issues, so please bear with me. I will have to reconnect again. Huh? Sure, sure. So I'm going to start sharing my screen. Yeah. And please give me feedback uh, when, uh, when I ask you if you see what I need you to see. And uh, okay. So far, do you see something? Yes. yes, we do. Yeah, we okay. Do. Yeah. Okay. And now, do you see now my presentation? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, the only problem here is I have too many windows on my screen, including my window. <laughs> uh, I don't know how to get rid of them. Let me just, uh, yes. Uh, but yeah. you are on full screen for us. Yeah, full screen. Yeah, but yeah, there are so many. Full screen. I know, but on my side, I have. I, I'm gonna have to hide you guys for now. <laughs> sure. Yeah. 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 So uh, okay. So all right. So hello, uh, everybody. Uh, good evening uh, or good afternoon to everyone. So first of all, I would like to thank the organizers of this uh, summer school, and in particular, Dr. Professor. Uh, Prasanta Panigrahi for the invitation to give this uh, virtual talk at your esteemed school. Uh, my talk will be on the basics of uh, Josephson Junction Physics. So while preparing my talk, I was mindful of the uh, broad background of participating students. So I'm hoping it will capture uh, their interest. Uh, and uh, so this Josephson effect uh, still remains one of the most uh, uh, noble manifestation of quantum phenomena uh, in all of the experimental science. So uh, it provides unique solutions to many uh, cutting edge problems and it has many advanced applications. Uh, and it actually, it provides uh, the uh, it offers the potential to control and to manipulate the, a macroscopic wave function uh, if uh, if the power of its coherent and collective behavior are fully exploited. So the material I will be discussing should be uh, should be helpful to students to follow uh, the descriptions of solid state realization of a quantum computer. Uh, as you know, uh, there is this proposal of superconducting qubits making use of these Josephson junctions. 
And uh, the result, uh, this uh, qubits uh, are different from qubits in other realization in the sense that they are made of large uh, number of electrons forming uh, a mesoscopic condensate. And this zero resistance of the superconducting metallic part uh, implies the absence of dissipation. And these facts enhanced by uh, a very low operating temperature uh, lead to the expectation that they are potentially robust against external noise and decoherence. So, uh, so here is the outline of my talk. So I'll, I'll go over some basic facts about superconductivity. Then I will talk about the BCS theory. I'm not going to go into the microscopic details, but the purpose is simply to give uh, uh, basically some useful concepts such as Cooper pairs, the order parameter, or the macroscopic wave function. Then I will talk about this Josephson junction effect and give uh, an intuitive derivation of the, uh, the two Josephson equations. Then I will examine some particular uh, Josephson uh, junction circuits and look at their Lagrangian, their Hamiltonian, and then uh, motivate uh, the quantization, the canonical quantization of these Hamiltonian. And then I will look at some ways how one can control the parameters that appears in that, uh, in that uh, Hamiltonian so that they can serve as controllable qubit. So uh, again, I said uh, I'm mindful of uh, student participants. So here I am just putting some general references. Uh, the, the literature is vast, but I selected some known uh, uh, titles like Tinkham for superconductivity. There is this textbook about Josephson physics by uh, Baron. And for the field theory and the effective uh, field description, there is this book by Shakel, nice book that gives all the derivation. And the last two review papers are available, and that's for the qubit uh, superconductor qubit realization, if somebody needs more detail. So, uh, sorry. So the hallmarks of superconductivity. So, uh, so at very low temperature, let me use my uh, uh, laser pointer. So at very low temperature, some materials become perfect conductors of electricity, and this is what we call superconductivity. So as this figure here shows, below some critical temperature, uh, uh, the electric resistance of the material abruptly disappears. And this was discovered in 1911 by uh, Kammerling who dedicated all his career to the exploration of extremely cold refrigeration. So important understanding of this phenomenon of superconductivity was made by Meissner, uh, who discovered that superconductors uh, actually expelled applied magnetic fields, as shown in this picture. And this phenomenon bears his name, the Meissner effect. Uh, in 1935, London showed that the Meissner effect was a consequence of the minimization of the electromagnetic free energy carried by superconducting current, and this causes the complete absence of electric resistance and the exclusion of the interior from the interior of the magnetic field below some critical temperature. Uh, in uh, 1950, Ginzburg Landau developed a phenomenological theory of superconductivity, which successfully explains the macroscopic properties of superconductors. And then uh, after that, the uh, uh, Bardeen, Cooper, and Schriever, they advanced their BCS theory. The phenomenon Josephson effect was discovered in 62 by Brian Josephson. So uh, just to give an idea about uh, what go, what's going on here. So in BCS theory, the atomic lattice vibration are directly responsible for unifying and moderating the current. So such vibration force the electrons to pair up, to pair up into partners that enable them to pass all the obstacles which cause electric resistance. And these partners are what we call the Cooper pairs. So this electron coupling is viewed as an exchange of phonons. Uh, and these phonons are the quanta of lattice vibrations. And that's essentially what causes the attractive 
or the effective attractive interaction between the electrons forming Cooper pairs. So these uh, electron Cooper pairs are coupled over a range of uh, hundreds of nanometers, three orders of magnitude larger than the lattice spacing. And the effective net attraction between the normally repulsive electron produces uh, a binding energy of the order of milli electron volts, enough to keep these pairs at extremely low temperature. So here uh, I put here the Lagrangian of the microscopic model where psi up, psi down describes the electrons with spin up, up, spin down. And the red term here describes this effective attraction between the fermions. So this uh, Lagrangian here has a, a, a UN symmetry, which is uh, psi going into exponential i theta psi. Uh -huh. And uh, so uh, here I'm going to motivate yeah, basically the, yeah. uh, the how we get this well, Ginzburg-Landau theory. So the motivation how we get this Ginzburg-Landau theory. So if we start from the partition function, which is a functional integration over the fermions, one can do what we call a hubbard stratonovich transformation to uh, basically integrate out the fermions and write the theory in terms of this complex field phi, which is a charge to objects because it's given as the product of two fermion fields, spin up and spin down. And uh, the details of this functional integration and all this calculation, uh, if somebody is interested, they are uh, in this nice book by Shakel. And uh, we end up with this effective theory in terms of this complex field phi, which plays the order parameter that describes the superconducting state. So uh, A here, it's simply the uh, uh, vector potential, which uh, describes the coupling to external uh, uh, electromagnetic field. The, the two red terms are, are for the, uh, uh, those describe the uh, effective potential which I draw here in this figure here. I'm just only showing one part of this potential. This is the famous Mexican hat. And this potential here has a, a minimum away from the origin where the symmetry is spontaneously broken. And as a, as a result of this spontaneous breaking of symmetry, when the field develops a vacuum expectation value here, uh, the, the gauge potential A or the uh, vector potential A gets a mass and that explains the Meissner effect. So for what follows in this talk, uh, we will simply use this macroscopic description of this quantum state in terms of this macroscopic wave function psi, which is related to the order parameter I just talked about. So this uh, macro, uh, macroscopic wave function described all these Cooper pairs that are condensed in the uh, ground state. So it has an amplitude which is uh, determined by the, which determines the density of Cooper pairs and a phase phi, which is common and that's the phase coherence of, the, uh, of this uh, superconducting state. And one can also, from that uh, ginzburg landau theory I showed you previously, when one can find the current density, which is given by this. And for rho constant, we can uh, simplify it into this expression in terms of the gradient of the phase phi and the vector potential. So this combination here will be very important when we discuss Josephson junctions uh, in the presence of a magnetic field. Okay? So this is a gauge invariant combination. So uh, Josephson effect uh, was discovered in uh, 1961. Uh, Brian Josephson at the time was a research student. So this should be interesting to, uh, to your students. He was a student at the Royal Society, Mond Laboratory in Cambridge under the uh, supervision of his uh, uh, supervisor, Brian Pepper. So uh, interesting to read uh, uh, from Josephson himself in his Lobel lecture. He noted that the atmosphere at the laboratory was very stimulating. In particular, at that time, Philip Anderson was, uh, was there. And actually, jo uh, Brian Josephson, he took a course 
uh, solid state and many body theory course from Philip Anderson. And he reported, and actually even Anderson himself uh, noted that in one of the Physics Today papers, that uh, when Josephson finished his calculation, he reported the results a day or two to his professor, Philip Anderson, who was very puzzled. And then he started doing the work to check this calculation. So that's a very nice, interesting thing to, to motivate students. So, so this effect is seen in a, 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 a junction, which is, a, this is just a schematic uh, diagram here. So you have two superconducting electrodes, one and two, and between them, there is a barrier. It can be an insulator, it can be a metal, it can be any, any weak link. Okay, uh, my screen is freezing. Uh, just bear with me, please. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, Thank you. Thank you. Be because my screen is actually freezing. Yes. So, okay, so it came back. <laughs> So, so, so let's discuss a little bit what goes on in this Josephson effect. So if you consider two pieces of superconductors in close proximity, like in this figure here, uh, with a barrier in between, which can be, as I said, vacuum, insulator, a metal, etc. If the barrier is small enough, you can see this Josephson effect, which is simply the flow of supercurrent between these two distinct disconnected pieces of superconductor. Now, if you think about it, this is quite remarkable because in this region here, in the barrier, there is no condition for superconductivity. So there is no attraction between electrons, there is no condensate, none of, the, of that is there. So yet somehow in this insulating barrier, a supercurrent can flow without dissipation. Now, if you take that piece of the insulator, for instance, and then you measure it separately, it will always have some finite resistance. But if you put it in between the two superconductors, you can pass a supercurrent without electric resistance. So that's very remarkable. And that's what we call the Josephson effect. And why this works? So you can think of this wave uh, function on the left, on the left, uh, overlapping with the one on the right because they are close. So, uh, so inside the superconductors, the wave function amplitudes are constant. They are constant. And outside the, the wave function amplitudes, uh, they slowly decay, as you can see here. So this is what we call the proximity effect. So uh, imagine uh, if the barrier is a metal, if this red barrier is a metal. So electron can fly in the barrier and for a while, they will remember each other phases. So they think they are still co-prepares for a brief time. So in the barrier, the amplitude of the wave function is reduced, as you see here. So, uh, but because it's not zero, it's not zero, uh, co-prepares can fly. Co-prepares can fly through the barrier, okay? And that's what gives rise to this Josephson effect. So one thing that's not shown in this picture is the phase, the phase. Remember I said that these functions, psi one and psi two, they have uh, amplitude and phases. And actually the phases of these superconducting, uh, uh, this macroscopic wave function, the phase difference is related to the supercurrent. So the supercurrent depends on the sign of that phase difference. Excuse the phase, me. sorry. So, um, there, there will be an option above on the top of your screen to disable attendee annotation because some people are drawing on the screen. Yeah, I noticed that. I noticed that uh, somebody uh, put uh, yeah these lines here. I don't know how to remove them. Yeah, but on the top of the screen, uh, go to more and there will be an option to disable attendee annotation. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, disable annotation for others. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Maybe you can reshare your screen so that uh, these lines will go. Okay, I'm, I hope that uh, the next slide will not show. So I'm just going to keep going. Okay. So probably it will not show in the next slide. Let me double check right away. Yes, oh, sir. it shows. I request everyone to please not do this. 
Oh, okay. Uh, it's, it's, it's very irritating. So it, please. It yeah. shows in every slide. Yeah. I don't know. So what should I do to so remove we, this? Maybe oh, just stop and then re reshare your screen. Oh, okay. Stop mm -hmm. and reshare. Okay. So I'll do that. So bear with me, please. Sorry for this process, Aki. No, no problem, no problem, no problem. By the way, um, at some point, uh, if you'd like to take a pause, there are some interesting questions that have come in from some of the students. Oh, okay. And, and I can read them out to you as and when you're ready. It's about basic okay. superconductivity. Oh, okay, so, okay. As and when you feel like taking a few questions, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll read them out to you. Oh, okay, okay, sure. Thank you. Uh, I just have some technical issue on my side, so please bear with me. Okay, I'm going to re restart. Something happened on my side. Uh, is this clear enough for you? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. So, okay. So, so, so we have now this supercurrent uh, passing through the barrier, and it's determined by the sign of the phase difference. So, as I mentioned previously, this phase difference, uh, I'm not going to call it delta phi. I just dropped that symbol delta. So, it's called phi here but it's a phase difference. Now, uh, the, uh, the normal current from the quasi-particles is suppressed because of this gap between the superconducting state, which is uh, below here. This is the superconducting state. And this large gap here uh, is basically related to the uh, energy to break up a Cooper pair. So, so, so the electro, uh, quasi particle tunneling from one superconductor to the other one is suppressed because of this large gap. So here I'm going to start now the uh, a simple uh, phenomenological uh, derivation of the two basic Josephson equations. So as I mentioned previously, because of the overlap of the wave functions, uh, we can uh, phenomenologically describe that overlap by uh, uh, this uh, term here, k times the product of psi 1 and psi 2. So this k plays the role of some kind of transition amplitude for a Cooper pair to tunnel from one side to the other side. And then we can now uh, apply Schrodinger equation to each superconductor in the presence of this uh, coupling between the two. So by the way, this derivation is due to Feynman. So Feynman is the one who came up with this nice derivation that avoids all the microscopic details. So it captures the essential physics. So when we write down the Schrodinger equation for each superconductor, and, uh, and then we up, apply up a voltage across the junction, which is related now to the difference uh, of energies of the two states, and if we define the zero of energy at E1 plus E2 over 2, then the two Schrodinger equation have this form. We can now substitute the wave function for each superconductor in terms of the uh, amplitude rho and the phase theta. And then we obtain four equations by simply equating the real and imaginary parts. 
And when we do that, then we get the two Josephson equations. So the first one gives us the current. I called it J here, but you can call it I. So the current is given in terms of the sign of the phase difference. So theta here is the, the, the phase uh, difference between the two superconducting wave functions. And the second equation tells you how that phase difference theta evolves with time when you put a voltage. So the dot on top of the letter means the derivative with the time. So these are the two important Josephson equations. Uh, now uh, we can look at them uh, separately. So the first one is what we call the DC Josephson effect. So if the voltage is zero, so, so the current is given by the sign of the, of the phase difference angle. If we apply a voltage, as I mentioned, the, the second equation, the, 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 uh, the phase difference will start increasing with time. And the current is now uh, an AC current, okay? A sign of an angle that's changing with the time. And this is what we call the AC Josephson effect. And in particular, the frequency of this AC is given by the voltage. So uh, another important thing that will be useful later when we, we discuss uh, these uh, Josephson circuits is the effect of a magnetic field on Josephson junctions. So here I consider a loop, a superconducting loop with two junctions inserted here and there. And this is what we call a squid, a superconducting quantum interference device. Then we apply a magnetic field. So there will be a flux here inside. And as I mentioned previously, uh, because of the gauge invariance, the phase uh, phi and the vector potential, they should always come up in this combination. So if we integrate out now this uh, around this loop here, uh, we get the, the phase difference phi 1 minus phi 2 for each junction plus basically the flux phi is the flux. Phi naught is the quantum of flux here. So the ratio between the flux and the quantum flux. So this tells us that the difference in this phase between the two junctions here is determined by, uh, by this uh, external flux. And this is one of the useful applications of these squids, very sensitive to uh, magnetic uh, fluxes. Uh, now, uh, for much later, this will be also a useful uh, relation. Uh, the current that's passing through the squid is the sum of two currents, one supercurrent uh, across the, uh, through the first junction, sine phi one, and the second current is through the second junction. And we can uh, uh, use simple trigonometric equations combined with this equation here to write that this current in terms of this equation here, where you can see that this uh, maximum current now, we can tune it with the external flux. Okay, that's one of the uh, very useful uh, 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 things that we will talk about later. Uh, also the energy, the energy, I'll talk about that later, the energy also of this Josephson junction, the energy for the squid can be also controlled. The Josephson energy can be controlled by this external flux. So it will be like a, a tuning parameter. And uh, what I have here for students, basically um, this squid and some of its applications, and for some of your students who are interested in quantum computers, of course, that's where you have this major application. So another important thing to talk about, which is the IV characteristic for a Josephson junction. So this is just a cartoon picture. It's not a real picture. So if you were to uh, uh, measure this uh, IV characteristic for a Josephson junction, one has to... Uh, basically sweep the current, one has to sweep the current. And uh, what one finds is that uh, uh, up to some uh, critical current here, uh, let me get my pointer, it disappears. Oh, my pointer went away, laser, okay, it's right here. So if we sweep the current, if we ramp up the current 
from zero and we keep increasing, increasing, there is no voltage that develops. But as soon as we reach this critical value of the current, then we jump. So this junction jumps into a finite voltage. If we increase the current above its critical value, then we add a junction enters into a different regime. And this is what we call the normal, uh, normal resistive uh, regime here. So we have this superconducting or the supercurrent, the supercurrent regime here, which is uh, gives you a, a supercurrent in terms of the sine phi. And, when, and then you have this uh, resistive uh, regime here. Okay, so, so when you are increasing basically the current from I equal zero, you're going basically from a phase phi equal to zero. And as you increase the current, as you increase the current, the phase phi is winding up, winding up until you get I equal IC, at which point the phase phi becomes pi over two. So uh, talking about the energy uh, of a Josephson junction, we can use the expression of that supercurrent, which is given by sine phi, and then we can cal calculate the energy stored in the junction by taking supercurrent times voltage dt. And then of course we use the Josephson equation. This is the second Josephson equation. And then we can integrate sine phi d phi. So this will give us the cosine here, the cosine of phi. So this, uh, in, uh, this introduces an, an energy scale uh, that we call the Josephson energy scale, which is given in terms of this critical current and the fundamental constant H bar and E. So this is very important uh, later when we talk about Lagrangian and the Hamiltonian of a junction. So uh, another energy associated with a junction is the charging energy. And this, uh, this uh, comes up naturally because uh, of the parallel plate geometry of the structure. We have this capacitance C and therefore we will have uh, a charging energy, okay? So this also introduces another energy scale, which is given by E squared over uh, C, which is the capacitance of the junction. So here I put here uh, the, uh, a model which is uh, called the resistively shunted junction model. So this model is useful because it provides an intuitive way to think about a Josephson junction. So the way we think about it is it's uh, three elements in parallel. So the ideal uh, Josephson junction here where you have a supercurrent that flows given by sine phi, you have the capacitance element here, then you have the resistive element, okay? So I'm just telling you the, uh, the general description for the quantum computing, we will, uh, uh, for applications for quantum computing, I will ignore this resistive element here. So, so the total current that passes through the junction will be the sum of three currents, the supercurrent, a resistive or normal current, and the displacement current. This displacement current here, it's basically dq dt. Since q is given by c times voltage, and since voltage is related to that d phi dt, the second Josephson equation, so we can write it as the second derivative of the phase phi with the time. And then we add up the three currents, so we get this, uh, this equation. Obviously, uh, this tells you that a junction, this Josephson junction is not, a, a, is not a linear element like resistors, capacitors, inductors, but it's non-linear because of this sine phi here. Now, there is a, a very nice analogy with the, uh, uh, a particle or a mass uh, in a potential. So that's equation that I just showed you here. We can actually write it like this, move the term second derivative to the left and the other terms to the right. So the first term here looks has a second derivative. So we can think of this like acceleration. So think of phi like X, the position of a particle. So therefore, this one plays the role of mass. These uh, capacitance with the fundamental constant plays the role of a mass. And uh, the force, the force is simply minus the derivative of the uh, potential energy here, which is given by the Josephson energy that I derived previously. 
and uh, the external current uh, will apply a tilt a tilt i is the external current so it will apply a tilt so it's a linear term in phi and if you draw this potential you you get this washboard potential here so this and of course the resistive element will will play the role of friction so this is a very nice analogy where you have simply ma time equal force uh, plus some resistive viscous uh, term here so uh what what will be interesting here is to look at the uh the quantum uh, uh, the quantum effect here, basically the macroscopic quantum tunneling. So if a particle is here, so uh, one might explore the situation where the particle will tunnel through. And this is the so-called uh, quantum macroscopic quantum tunneling because we're dealing with a phase phi, okay? And that phase phi is itself a macroscopic quantity. So, uh, so in the 80s, this has been actually uh, measured experimentally, this macroscopic quantum tunneling. It has been uh, uh, detected in uh, several experiments that were done at low temperature to avoid this kind of classical thermal, uh, basically, uh, uh, motion here. So they had to work at low temperature to suppress this kind of thermal effect and simply observe quantum effect, and it was done in the 80s. Um, my, my, as you have to bear with me, my screen actually keeps freezing for some reason. Uh, can you hear my voice? Is it clear? Yeah, we can hear you. Thank you, sir. thank you. Just my screen is freezing, uh, it's uh, freezing, so I cannot uh, move the slide to the next one. Uh, Professor Saki, you've given a wonderful, uh, this thing, you know, introduction to the phenomena. Uh, mm -hmm. We have a few questions from the students. Yes, uh, yes. Would, should we field them now? Should we take care of them now? Yes, if, if my screen stops freezing so that I can go back, yeah, please uh, tell them to, uh, yeah. If okay, they can. so they've written it in the chat box. Chat box. Uh, sh okay. Should I read them out to you or encourage the students to? Uh, please just read the, a few for me. Read a okay. few for me. Okay. All right. So, uh, well, one question is a very general question. Is it possible to achieve superconductivity at, uh, I think, what they mean is standard temperature and pressure conditions? Basically, room temperature and pressure. Oh, yes. Yes. So, that's high TC superconductivity. Yes. Well, high temperature, high high TC superconductivity. That's that's not room temperature, but that's it's high enough in terms of uh, uh, what can be achieved in the laboratory. Uh, uh, room temperature. Uh, that's a dream, of course. Uh, we hope to achieve that in the future, but uh, so far, uh, I haven't heard about that. But there is high temperature, high like 120 Kelvin. So that's high enough for us. But in, in my talk, I just, I'm just talking about uh, basically conventional superconductors, uh, superconductors, which are really at very, very low temperature. So this is like uh, 4 Kelvin, uh, 5 Kelvin, and so on. All right. The next question is about phonons uh, mm. in, in, and how they're involved in the mechanism. And the question goes as follows. Could phonons also interact... And if so, in the area in which they interact, will they be energetic enough to cause an electronic transition above the Fermi level of the Cooper pair? Wow, this is very this is very it's technical. Very yeah, very yes. technical. It's too yes. technical. Uh, in my talk, I didn't go into uh, these kind of technical issues, uh, but. Uh, but uh, for uh, for BCS superconductivity, phonons, they play a major role. And that's what gives rise to this attractive, effective attraction between the electrons. And there is uh, energy associated with these uh, phonons. Uh, I did not mention that in my slides. And I cannot think in terms of, uh, I can't remember uh, the order of magnitude of this energy scale involved by these phonons. But all of these uh, uh, issues uh, for your students, uh, the, the textbook by Tinkham, who is an experimentalist 
he actually gives nice description with with the quantitative uh, numbers and tables and uh, people can actually look up, up this information there i think a very quick answer maybe uh, mm -hmm. if if you'll allow me to sure uh, please go ahead yeah. a very quick answer maybe the fact that uh, we are working at very low temperatures where there are very few phonons and mm. uh, there there aren't i mean since it's a, like a dilute gas of phonons which is uh, mediating these uh, mediating the inter electronic interaction the attraction Mm. Uh, there isn't too much scope for uh, inelastic scattering between them. I think mm -hmm. the question was sort of hinting at the possibility of inelastic scattering, I which see. might actually break up these Cooper pairs. I see. So I there see. isn't too much scope for them at lower temperatures. Yes. But of course, yeah. as you go up to higher temperatures, then the inelastic scattering between phonons mm -hmm. will also increase, and thereby they, there is a chance that these phonons will also then start, you know, such interaction, inelastic interaction might start breaking up the Cooper pairs. So there is yeah. that possibility, but you'd have to go to, I guess, to higher temperatures yeah. where you have a more, uh, I mean, not so dilute a gas of, of phonons. You want to have a much more dense gas of phonons for that. Yeah, so it. we would be breaking the pairs, the Cooper pairs. That's right. Because right. right. there would be enough energy available in the system. That's right. So, but these energies we're talking about that keeps the pairs, uh, it, this is like milli, milli electron volts. So one has to go above that. One has to go above that to break them apart. That's right. Great, great. So these are interesting questions from your students, but the textbook by, by Tinkham is very useful. It gives more details. Uh, so if I can just continue. Uh, sure. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so this, uh, this uh, washboard potential here, uh, it will be interesting uh, to explore uh, situations where we have quantum mechanics, uh, in uh, we we could have a situation where we have a, a, a double a double well like this here where we have a quantized states. In this case, it will be symmetrical, and if we increase the tilt, we can have actually situations like this where we lift the degeneracy here between these states. So I'll come back. I will come back to this here when we discuss uh, one of these. Uh, so uh, one of these uh, circuits involving Josephson elements. So, uh, uh, so to continue with this formal transition to the quantum limit, so if we think of the phase phi as a coordinate like x and p is the momenta, then we have uh, this kind of uncertainty the principle, the familiar one in quantum mechanics. Uh, as I mentioned before, the mass, the mass in the case of the Josephson, so it uh, involves the capacitance here. So, uh, uh, so if we look at this momentum p, we can actually use a Josephson equation to write it in terms of this voltage. And because c times v is the charge, then we have a nice interpretation of this momentum P as simply H bar times the number of Cooper pairs. So Q over 2E will be simply the number of Cooper pairs. So therefore, the uncertainty relation here, it's basically between, right, I wrote it here, it's between the, uh, the number of Cooper pairs and the phase, the phase. So there is this uncertainty which means that if you, if you know very well the number of Cooper pairs, then of course we have no knowledge about the phase and vice versa. So, so this will give rise to, to, to two regimes. In one regime, we have the charge coherence, and this is the case when the charging energy is much larger than the Josephson energy scale. So this will be the case as an application. It will be the case of the charge qubits. And in the other regime, we will have the phase coherence, in which case EC, the charging energy, will be much less than the Josephson energy, and that will be a, a, an application for the flux qubit. So, so here in this slice, I mentioned the, the roughly uh, the two major classes that involve Josephson junctions, qubits. So one makes use of the flux or the phase degree of freedom. So here the number of magnetic flux quanta threading a loop made of several Josephson junctions is a quantum variable. And... Uh, 
uh, two flux states may be arranged to have almost degenerate energies by controlling the external field. And these, they, they, the two states, they work as a qubit. So this is one, one application. The other one, uh, it, it uses the charge degree of freedom. So there, the number of excess copper pairs in an island between a small capacitance Josephson junction and a capacitor that is serially connected to the junction is a, a relevant quantum variable. And the energies of the states with different number of copper pairs are controlled by a gate voltage. I'll, I'll talk about this uh, later in a little bit more details. And, uh, and then it is possible to have two states with almost degenerate energies by applying uh, some appropriate gate voltage. And these two states, they serve as a qubit in this kind of proposal. So, so here, uh, I put uh, the the basic circuits. Uh, these are the like the uh, the building blocks, okay? That one can use to build more complex structure. So the first one here is the so-called single current bias Josephson junction. So here you have uh, the uh, uh, a tunnel junction uh, connected to a source of current. And the second one is uh, what we call the single copper pair box. So here you have the uh, uh, a small superconducting island right here, which is connected via Josephson Junction Tunnel to a, a large superconducting reservoir. And it is uh, uh, driven by an applied voltage. So this is the gate voltage that controls the charge. Okay, the offset charge that we put on the uh, in the junction. The third circuit is uh, a, involves a squid. This is called RF or AC squid. So here we have a superconducting loop, and then we insert a junction here, and then we apply an external magnetic field. The, 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 the fourth one also involves a superconducting loop, but it has two junctions, and then they are connected to a, a, a current source. So, uh, so I'm gonna now uh, start a discussion of the uh, Lagrangian, the Hamiltonian associated with the uh, some circuits like this one here, the single current biased Josephson junction circuit. So uh, I will be dropping this resistive element. So the dotted element here, I will ignore it. Because in my mind, I am uh, I'm thinking of showing you the quantization of this classical Lagrangian. So if we have a resistive element here, in order to, to, to do quantization, one has to do more work. So this is a legate uh, uh, description in terms of uh, a bath of oscillators that will take care of the resistance, but I, I am not gonna talk about that here. So I will be dropping this term here. So I will be considering the supercurrent in the junction and the displacement current here, which is the through the capacitance here. This is the Josephson equation, uh, the second one. So, so the external current from the source is the sum of these two currents, okay? So this is basically simply Kirchhoff rules for our students. So this, I'm simply writing Kirchhoff rule, you know, these Kirchhoff rules, the, uh, the current that enters is equal to the sum of these two currents. And uh, I would like to look at this equation now, this equation, I would like to look at it as uh, arising from some Lagrangian, okay? Because I would like to find the Hamiltonian and then do the canonical quantization. So, so, so we can show that this Lagrangian, uh, which is kinetic term minus potential term, so I have already motivated you uh, before uh, when I did the analogy with the mechanical particle in that washboard potential. So the, the capacitive term will uh, appear in this kinetic term here. So phi dot to the power two is the kinetic term. 
And the potential energy involves the cosine and the external uh, bias current here with this linear term. So again, uh, we can find the momentum P uh, from this Lagrangian by taking the derivative of phi dot. So for our student, a dot on a letter means a derivative with respect to time. So this is the momentum. And then we can write down the Hamiltonian as P times phi dot minus the Lagrangian. And then we get our Hamiltonian here. So here you have the P squared term, and then you have the, uh, some constant terms will be dropped, but I write them here. This one can be dropped. So we will simply consider Ej times minus cosine minus this term here. And then uh, the, this Hamilton equation, we can check that they give us exactly the equation that we started with, which is this one here. Okay, so, so this is the, uh, the, the Hamiltonian. And uh, as again, uh, like before, let me just re-mention uh, re it here. This momentum P has a physical meaning. It's basically related to the number of Cooper pairs. So it's H bar times the number of Cooper pairs. And, uh, and we can write the Hamiltonian in terms of this number of Cooper pairs operator and the cosine phi, I have dropped that constant, you know, when you have a constant in an energy, you can simply drop it. Uh, then we, uh, the quantization, we will do this. Uh, we have now the uh, commutation relation between the phase phi and the number n of Cooper pairs. So this is now an operator. And uh, of course, n uh, will play the role of minus i d d phi. So this is consistent with this commutation relation. And then we can write down uh, the, uh, the time evolution of a wave function in terms of this Hamiltonian. So the Hamiltonian will have terms that have cosine phi, but terms with the, the operator n will, will, uh, will uh, will be represented by minus i derivative with respect to the angle. So, uh, so if we look at now this potential here, this potential here, this u consisting of the cosine and phi. So we can draw it, it's a kind of washboard potential. And when, when the interesting limit is to tune the external current to the critical superconducting current, so if we do that, then we can find that the potential has some extrema with a minimum X minus that occurs here. Uh, for some reason, my pointer disappears and uh, I try to bring it back, but it freezes my screen. So um, can you see the mouse moving? No. No, because my pointer keeps disappearing. Oh. And when I click uh, show pointer, my screen freezes. Oh. So that's, a, I don't know what's going on. It's, a, it's an issue I have with my PC here. Uh, uh, X minus is the location of the minimum here. And uh, if you think of a particle oscillating at that minimum, we can find the harmonic oscillator frequency, which is basically given by the second derivative of this potential written in blue here. If you do the second derivative, and then uh, at that minimum, x at minus, then we can get the frequency. And then we can find that there are actually some bound state that survive in that small well. And the ground and the first excited state will serve like a qubit. Now, uh, this is interesting now. I'll spend more time about this one, a single Cooper pair box. So as I mentioned- uh, this Saki, just one small question. Yes. In, in that plot that you showed there, Yes. Those, those bound states presumably are metastable in the sense that uh, there's always the possibility that the system will tunnel out of them, right? Yeah, well, uh, one has to work with this, uh, you know, with this uh, tuning, you tune this parameter. Okay. I external, you know, you keep okay. tuning it, tuning right. it right. closer to the critical current. Right. And then you, 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 you analyze this uh, harmonic oscillator sure. frequency below here, and you compare it to the height, the height. You see right. this delta right. U. 
Right. Yeah. So one has to play with these two control parameters, the frequency okay. and the height. And the height. And then uh, and then one can check that uh, three three or oh, three survive. Okay. Yeah, and the first and the gr the ground state and the first excited they can they can okay. be used. Yeah. They can yeah. Be used. Okay. Yeah. So so in this uh, circuit, which consists of a small superconducting island connected via Josephson Junction to this reservoir, superconducting reservoir. So uh, so this is driven by a gate voltage, and then. Uh, and then here again, I will. Uh, you, one can apply uh, the same uh, Kirchhoff rules I mentioned. So we can, one can write the electrostatic energy, which serves as a kinetic energy, as C V squared over two. That's for the uh, junction, the Josephson junction, and for the uh, for the uh, for the gate for the for the capacitive, the gate this capacitive C gate here we have the other uh, electrostatic energy. And uh, this V here, we can use, let me try my pointer one more time. Yes, now it's coming. So this V here, this V here, we can use that uh, 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 Josephson second equation to write it in terms of the phase. And then we can simply com uh, complete a square Again, it disappeared. Sorry, and uh, it keeps uh, <laughs> it please freezes. Don't, please don't worry about it. If it yeah. freezes, your thing. It freezes and then it disappears. Yeah. So these two terms here, uh, C V squared over two, and the other term, we can write them in terms of the phase. And then we simply do algebraic step, which is completing the square, and then we end up with this second line here. And then we can drop this constant, the constant to be dropped. That one, it's just a number. We can drop it. So that's the kinetic term, basically, that uh, uh, for this circuit. And then, of course, we have the energy, the Josephson energy. And then we, we can write down our Lagrangian as the kinetic term minus the potential uh, energy here. And then we, we can, uh, like previously, we can uh, get the Hamiltonian and do the quantization. And this time, we will have N minus N gate. So this is the offset charge that we can control, we can control it by this gate voltage. So this gate voltage here will control this offset charge, okay? So we can change it and control it. So uh, in particular, if I look at now the regime, EC much larger than EJ. So remember, EC is the charge in energy, which is basically related to the energy to add a Cooper pair on an, on an island. So if that energy scale is much larger than the Josephson energy, then we can basically work with the, the pair a number operator acting on these states here that will give us the number N of uh, uh, Cooper pairs. And, uh, and as I mentioned, because of the commutation relation, N will be like a minus I derivative of this uh, phase phi. And then we have these states, okay? We can use them. And uh, what we can do now, we can check uh, what happens when the NG is closer to 0.5, okay, 0.5. So in that case, we find that the states 0, N equal 0, and N equal 1 are, 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 are almost degenerate because EC, remember, it's much larger than EJ, okay? So, so 0 minus... 0 for n on this state minus 0.5 is the same thing as n equal 1 for this state minus 0.5, okay? So, so we get basically uh, these two states that are almost uh, uh, nearly degenerate when ng is tuned to a value which is closer to 0.5. And what we can do, we can now do a projection of the Hamiltonian in the subspace spanned by these two states, n equal zero and n equal one. So basically, this is a very nice and simple calculation for students to do, which is basically to take this Hamiltonian here, the Hamiltonian in the previous slide, this Hamiltonian here, and then to calculate the matrix element of this Hamiltonian uh, in the state 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. So that's how we do the projection. 
And then we end up with this two by two matrix when NG is closer to 0.5. So we drop all the terms that are higher order in this uh, difference. And then we can find the projection Hamiltonian, which I write here in terms of Pauli matrices, sigma Z and sigma X. And I'm using here a notation of an effective magnetic field, but this is not a real magnetic field. This is simply parameters that are given by uh, the number uh, or the, uh, uh, the offset charge on, on the island and the Josephson parameter. So this parameter here, BZ, is controllable by changing the gate voltage, as you can see here. But this parameter EJ uh, depends on the junction. So once a, a junction is fabricated, EJ is fixed. You can't change it anymore, unless, of course, uh, if the junction breaks down. Uh, so, so we would like now to, to find a way how we can tune this parameter. And this can be done by using a squid. So I'll talk about that later. So, uh, so remember, I mentioned about squids in an external magnetic field. So, so that external magnetic field is actually going to be uh, changing this uh, Josephson energy. It will depend on the external flux. And that will be a, a way how you can control this uh, parameter that appears in the Hamiltonian here. So here I'm just going to show you uh, the eigenvalues that we get from uh, this. Uh, so this is a standard calculation for uh, your students. They can simply do the diagonalization and then find the eigenvalues and find the uh, eigenstates. And uh, this angle phi is determined by the two parameters that appear in the Hamiltonian. I remember, BZ is, can be tuned, can be controlled by the, uh, the offset charge, and G, which can be controlled by the gate voltage. But BX is related to the Josephson energy. And uh, so that's one drawback. One drawback of the circuit that I showed you is that uh, BX is not controllable. So we need to do something. And this is the role of a squid. So here is the, the spectrum that one can get. Uh, the, 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 when EJ uh, over EC is zero, in other words, when you have only the charging energy, so you have these thin curves, which are simply parabolas. These are simply parabolas, the thin ones. But when you add the Josephson term, a small Josephson term, then you have these thick curves here. So you have the ground state and the excited state that you get from that diagonalization that I showed you. Um, sorry, um, my screen is freezing. And uh, OK, so it came back. So, uh, so, so as I mentioned previously, a squid is needed. Uh, it's a solution to uh, tune that parameter that I call BX. Because when you put a squid that involves these two junctions, uh, we will have, as I mentioned much earlier, that the current that will pass through the squid is the sum of two currents because you have two junctions. And you can write this sum and also combining it with this uh, phase difference that is controlled by the external flux. You can write the current in terms of, of this external flux. And you can do the same thing for the, the energy, the Josephson energy. So the Josephson energy of this squid here is the sum of two terms. One Josephson energy here in this junction and, in, and the other one for the other junction. So again, you can combine these two cosines by using simple trigonometry with this relation here. And then we can show that the, the, the total energy is given now in terms of an effective, an effective Josephson scale here, which we can control by the external flux. So, so this is the, the solution. So the circuit now we add this squid here, where we now, so these two, these two, they play the role of basically an effective junction, which is given by this. 
And the Hamiltonian is like before, but now the benefits of this now is that Bx can be controlled. So now we have, we can control both parameters. We can control Bz through the gauge voltage that changes Ng. And we can control Bx through the external flux that changes the Josephson energy that appears in Bx. So, uh, so, so we can now look at the uh, those states that we get when we diagonalize that uh, two by two Hamiltonian, and we can check what happens to the states when uh, the flux is tuned to to this value. Phi naught is the quantum flux. So if the external electric, uh, if the external magnetic flux is tuned to half of the quantum flux, so the ground state uh, approaches the state with zero pair, co a Cooper pair, and the first excited state of that Hamiltonian, it approaches this state with one Cooper pair. Uh, we can play the same game with the uh, NG. Remember, NG is that uh, offset charge that you can control with the gate voltage. So if we play with that number, when it gets closer to 0.5, the ground state gets closer to the, this combination, the sum of these two states, zero Cooper pair, one Cooper pair, and the excited state is given now by the difference. Uh, uh, normally, I will stop here. Uh, is there any question? Uh, if uh, your student have any question, I have more slides to show. But uh, if students have some questions, I, I can answer them at this moment. Um, so let us thank the speaker first for a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Saki. That was indeed wonderful, even for somebody who's familiar with a lot of this stuff like me it was it was really nice to you know thank see you. your presentation thank you uh, very much students uh, many of you have asked questions in the chat box uh, i was only able to ask a couple of them to uh, professor saki why don't uh, you guys now step up uh, you know and ask him yourself just unmute one at a time uh, in the order of the questions that were asked so i'll call out a name and then maybe, uh, you know, you can step up and ask your question. So there was a question from Navneet Krishnan. Uh, Navneet, would you like to unmute and ask your question, please? Hello? Yes, Navneet, please. Yeah. Navneet, would you like to ask your question? Uh, okay. Some people, they forget to unmute, uh, unmute themselves, yeah. Right, so, okay, I'll go ahead and ask on, on, on behalf of Navneet. Uh, Navneet, uh, this question is very uh, basic about the Josephson effect. He's asking, what would be the approximate length of the insulator up to which the Josephson effect is observable? So that sandwich, the layer that oh, within okay. the sandwich. Yeah, it has to be thin, very thin. So that's one of the requirements. It must be thin because, um, um, because of the... Uh, uh, if it's too thick, uh, uh, there will be uh, basically the uh, the pairs that tunnel through. They will lose their phase coherence. So, uh, so quantitatively, it has to do with the the coherence length. Okay, of that superconducting uh, wave function that overlaps in the junction. I don't have in front of me any, uh, you know, quantitative numbers to give your student, but this is fairly basic stuff that uh, one can uh, read in a table. There are tables in textbook like the one I mentioned, but it must be thin. The barrier must be thin. That's that's very important. Uh, the next question is by Deepan. He's asking. Is the mass gain of the symmetry breaking of the effective potential for the fermions or the phonons? So he's talking about a presumably the Mexican hat potential. Yeah, yeah. And when we have the symmetry breaking uh, of the effect within the effective potential, is the mass gain for the fermions or for the phonons? 
Right. Uh, so when the when this field phi here develops a vacuum expectation value phi here, uh, so that determines the gap phi. This phi here, it will it will fix the gap the gap, which is basically related to the uh, energy. Twice the gap. Twice the gap is basically the energy that one has to provide to break up that copper pair. So if you want to break it up, you have to give that much energy, twice the gap. I hope it's... Uh, it yeah, I mean, I think your answer is quite clear. It's, it's essentially a mass gap for the uh, yeah. fermionic excitations, for the electronic yes. excitations. It's the, here, you the, can see it. The Boglibov, uh, the Boglibov quasi-particles. Exactly, yes, yeah. So this picture here might help as well, yeah. So that delta is related to the phi, okay? It's an order parameter, so it's related to it. The next question is again, is again by Deepan. Uh, he's asking, how does the tunneling of the order parameter get affected if there is if if there are energy gradients within the junction? Could there be eddy currents in the squid which might cause phase gradients? Eddy eddy currents. Well, eddy. well, this this effect is observed even in the vacuum. By the way, huh? even in the vacuum, even if there is a vacuum between the two superconductor. Or even if you make a narrow constriction, so so this effect is very general. You can have insulator, you can have a metal, okay, and you can have uh, uh, you know uh, a vacuum. So so this effect is very very robust. Uh, of course, the requirement is that that uh, that barrier must be very thin. It must be very thin. I do not go into other description in terms of Andreev, uh, Andreev reflections. Okay, so but that, because that's another way, another model one can use to explain what goes on inside the barrier. Inside the barrier, uh, you have electron that come from this side. It hits the barrier at that side, and then a hole is reflected this way and an electron is created, and that electron is created is the partner of the first electron. And then we can have multiple Andreev reflections. So I didn't go into that because that's very, very, uh, a little bit deep for students. Um, yeah, if I may, uh, there is a nice discussion of this uh, as a quantum mechanical phenomenon in the mm. book by Levy. Levy. Uh, on, yes, L.P. Levy. There's a beautiful discussion of uh, the, the Josephson effect. Uh, and he basically sees this as a problem of uh, tunneling across a barrier, but a very special kind of barrier in which you can also have the Andreev effects. So yes. exactly as you were mentioning, yes. you can also have Andreev conversions. Yes. So essentially the physics is that of a fabri, fabri uh interferometer. Yes, 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 yes. In optics. That's true. This is the, actually the particle or the Cooper pair version of the fabri yes. system. Yes, 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 exactly. So that's a very beautiful uh, optics analogy. Yes, exactly. Uh, uh, I think as far as the eddy currents are concerned, those would typically uh, give rise to resistive effects. Yeah. So if there are certain su such eddy currents, then they would probably destroy the superconductivity. I mean, break, start breaking Cooper pairs. They would destroy the Josephson effect. Yeah, but that would be that would be very specific to a kind of materials in the barrier. Right. That's yeah. right. So the yeah. next question is also quite interesting. Uh, as the uh, just like the superconductor, is there a super semiconductor which can increase the efficiency <laughs> of thermoelectric generator? A super semiconductor. So, a what's the definition of a super semiconductor? <laughs> the one that's. The, yeah, the one. would you like to answer his question? He's asking, <laughs> what do you mean by super semiconductor? Well, maybe Rohan is here or not. I, I don't know. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. So I'll be interested to learn more about super semiconductors. That's right. So there's a. I know about uh, I know about yeah. uh, super solids and Dr. Prasanta right. Panigrahi. He wrote actually some paper about these super solids. Yeah, but that's a different phenomena from that's uh, right. what we're talking about. So yeah. I think the confusion can be cleared very easily by pointing out that semiconductors are essentially insulators at zero mm -hmm. temperature. 
Right, and, yes. And, and superconductors are a different phenomenon altogether. Yes, yes. So yes. these are very different states of matter, Rohan, and yeah. you can't actually confuse the two. Uh, yeah, so, yeah. so an insulator is something that does not allow current to pass. Yeah. yeah. And that's just it. Whereas a yeah. superconductor is a state within which at least you can have Cooper pairs flowing, like yeah. uh, Professor Saki was discussing. Yeah. So I think that should take care of that question. Yeah, yeah. So the for the semiconductors in their pure state, they're they're really insulators, but then you can control the way they conduct by doping. Right. By right. doping, so you can um, you can increase their resistivity and and, and uh, their conductivity, and uh, and they're very useful, of course, in semiconductor industry. Uh, but now the revolution that we are uh, witnessing now is these superconductors taking over the role of the semiconductors. You know, we would like to have electronics that uses superconductors. And that's the dream, basically, because this will lead to supercomputers and so on. <laughs> so that's the next revolution. So in the in the order, in the sequence of the questions that were asked, the next question is uh, from Sumantro, and he says, maybe my question is too basic, but what is the difference in the mechanism of the conventional super superconductor and the high-temperature superconductor? And how can we perceive which metal may undergo conventional type of superconductivity and which one will under, will show you high temperature superconductivity? Well, the second question is very difficult to answer. So that's material science. Right. Yeah, that's material science. And uh, I don't think that there is a recipe uh, th uh, that one can follow to find out which one will give you uh, uh, classical or conventional superconductivity and which one gives you uh, uh, high TC. I think it's uh, it's uh, basically uh, people try things and uh, and then some some things work and some things don't work. Maybe with the new revolution using this uh, this new uh, because now material scientists now are hiring people uh, in computer science <laughs> using this uh, advances in artificial intelligence and this. Uh, Maybe there are ways to predict. You, the computer can actually help you to predict uh, uh, what combination of atoms will give you uh, a non-conventional superconductor. Uh, but as far as the mechanism is concerned, uh, conventional superconductivity is well understood. So basically, it's a, it's a, a, the BCS mechanism, which means the... Uh, uh, lattice vibrations, they play a major role. Now, high TC, uh, there are several models. Uh, I haven't followed up the, the latest development, but uh, there is no clear uh, answer. There are several models, and each model has uh, some, uh, you know, explains certain facts, but cannot explain other facts. So, uh, I don't think there is a 100% agreement what is the mechanism for high TC superconductivity. Unless if I was uh, in a coma in the last days, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> right, and, and, and you missed the Nobel Prize being given yes, to somebody. Yes, exactly, exactly. Right. Yeah. All right. Uh, yes, uh, Shumantro, uh, I'll come to you. Uh, oh, is it in related to this question? Yes, sir. Actually, just okay. a small part. Means actually, right. I am currently a student of material, metallurgical and material science. And uh, I'm currently pursuing a bachelor's in uh, uh, metallurgical and material science and engineering from NIT Raipur. Um, so I have come across this question uh, during my first year of studies uh, with my professors. So they were exp able to explain about the conventional uh, methods of with the help of BCS theory. But one of the... Um, Means during one of the classes, my professor also mentioned about the high temperature superconductivity. So when uh, we post about what is what exactly is the high temperature superconductivity, so none of them were like uh, too much confident exactly what is the mechanism and how is it like uh, how to deal with it. That's why I post this question. Oh, great, great! Because there are several proposals and uh, different groups they they are pushing for their explanation. So there is no general agreement. What is the real mechanism? And even the normal state of these high TC superconductors, even the normal state, it has some controversial effect. You know, there are certain uh, abnormal uh, effects there, and people are trying to come up with uh, explanations. So these high TC materials, their phase diagram is very complex, okay? Uh, 
There is anti-ferromagnetism, there is superconducting state, and there is a normal state. So Dr. Pan, uh, Prasanta Panigra, he, I remember in the past, he did some, uh, uh, some, some, you know, some investigation and we had discussions and uh, there is a Philip Anderson that I mentioned, uh, he came up, he was pushing uh, his ideas but there are other groups as well who are pushing different ideas. So there is no general agreement. But you know, Said, you will be happy to know that Sidat yeah. had uh, some insight about this uh, normal page, you know, abnormal normal page. You know, this. Uh, oh, that's this interesting. Like that. You know, interesting. This, this. Yeah. So essentially, I'm I'm sorry. Uh, maybe we. I'll I'll tell you that after we've taken all the students' sure. questions. Yes, please go. Otherwise, ahead. it would be bad of me as the moderator too. Okay. okay. Yeah. I'll so, uh, Shumansu, very nice question. Uh, okay, let's move to the next one by Nabia. Uh, he or she asks, sir, when you said that the Josephson energy changes only when there is a breakdown, how does the breakdown take place here? Oh, uh, when I mentioned about, uh, you know, those uh, parameters, EC and EJ, so when these groups, experimentalists, when they fabricate these junctions, uh, those parameters, EC and EJ, are, are fixed once the construction or the fabrication, the fabrication of the device is made, those parameters are fixed, okay? So you cannot change them, you cannot uh, change their values, okay? Uh, so I said, uh, I shouldn't have said that breakdown because when it breaks down, then you have to throw it away and then you have to get a new device. So what I showed you in one of the slides later is that the parameter EJ, that parameter EJ, you can, you can change its value in an effective way. I'm moving the slide so that I can show you uh, where it is, uh, getting closer, yes. So if you put two junctions now, now each junction has its own uh, uh, energy scale, EJ, okay? But now if you put two of them and then you put a magnetic field, a flux, external flux inside, then this device, this behaves like a single, a single uh, tunnel junction with an effective, you can see it in red here, an effective Josephson uh, parameter, you see? So now you can change uh, the value of this parameter EJ, not that EJ, you see this EJ is fixed by fabrication, this one. This number here, it's fixed by uh, fabrication. But the cosine, you can change its value because you can change the external flux, you see that phi? If you increase the external magnetic field, you increase the value of that phi. So this is the way how we control this uh, Josephson uh, scale. I hope it uh, helps uh, Navia, okay? So, um, all right, so then let's go to the next question. Shyam asks, uh, does the barrier's conductivity affect the tunneling effect, provided it's very thin? Uh, well, uh, as I mentioned, uh, it can be vacuum. And you know that vacuum, uh, vacuum, it's like a, a perfect insulator. So, uh, so, uh, so as long as that barrier is thin, so somehow the copper pairs they can tunnel through, and that's because of the proximity effect that I mentioned. Okay, so that if proximity effect is important. Essentially, the wave function uh, inside the superconductor it can be constant but then it actually decays slowly outside. And as long as there is a decay, then there is overlap, and therefore there is possibility for Cooper pair uh, tunneling. I hope uh, this helps uh, Shama, Shama's question. Uh, the next question is from Deepak, uh, who asks, uh, is it possible to change the doping concentration in a semiconductor in order to make it a superconductor? So that's the first part of this question. Can one oh. change the doping of a semiconductor in order to make it a superconductor? Uh, uh, I, uh, I haven't heard about any material that you can, uh, then you can turn from uh, semiconducting to superconducting. I haven't heard about that. 
Yeah, there was a very controversial pr uh, proposal by Gerd Sh uh, by Schoen, this man sure. called Schoen, a long time ago, which mm -hmm. was proved to be fraudulent. Oh. Maybe you remember this from 20 years ago. Oh, Sean, Sean. Sean. You remember the Sean controversy? Yeah, German, was, right? German. Uh, he was a German, right? Yes. And he yes. actually claimed that you could tune semico uh, a doping concentration in, yeah. in, a, in, a, in a semiconductor and make it oh. into a superconductor. Wow, but yeah, it, yeah. It, 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 and he published a lot of papers uh -huh. and he got a lot of fame. Yes, And yes. then it turned out that he was actually cheating. Yeah, yeah. but this Sean is not the Sean who is not very the active. Yeah. No, no, not the Gerd Sean. Sorry, oh, okay. that was my mistake. This is another Sean. Oh, okay, this is a yeah. Jan Hendrik Sean. Oh, okay. It's a young guy. Yeah, yeah. It was a young guy. Yeah, yeah. Probably yeah. he left the field and he's somewhere else. He probably. was destroyed. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's a very sad story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but he was cheating. Yes, yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Interesting to remind us about. I forgot right. completely about it, yeah. That's right. But that's what he was claiming, essentially. Oh, yes, yes. So even yes. I remembered this after seeing Deepak's questions. Very nice question. Oh, okay. Nice, yeah. nice. But it's never been achieved till date. Oh, okay. So yeah. we don't want to associate ourselves with <laughs> <laughs> the fraud. Second, so yeah. he has a second question. Um is it possible to observe Josephson effect in a type 2 superconductor? Uh, yeah, there is actually a nice uh, 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 book, Springer book. Uh, I can, I can uh, give the reference where actually uh, the latest results about Josephson effect using high TC superconductivity. Uh, uh, so uh, I have the reference somewhere here. Uh, I did not put it as a reference because it's a very recent one. It's a very recent uh, reference in the field, but it's a Springer publishing book. Uh, yes, I think I have it here. It's Francisco Tafuri, T-A-F-U-R-I, T-A-F-U-R-I. So the so so it's the title is fundamentals. And Frontiers of the Josephson Effect, Springer Publishing. The editor is Francisco Tafuri, T-A-F-U-R-I, uh, where they uh, discuss uh, uh, Josephson Effect using uh, high TC materials. But uh, just to give uh, my my input on the on this uh, question, uh, I think it is the the uh, to 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 operate at, at very low temperature is very beneficial for in terms of uh, you know uh, the uh, to eliminate the decoherence okay so if you're working with the if you're operating at a little bit high temperature that's not uh, that's not advantageous okay but i could be wrong okay i mean i could be wrong uh, maybe there are they found other ways how they can uh, achieve uh, uh, how they can work with uh, these high TC materials uh, in applications with these uh, superconducting qubits. Okay, but that reference, uh, I, I have it. Uh, I have read a few things, uh, but I didn't go that far. You know, there are so many things to read uh, <laughs> in this field here. So it's a good reference. Okay, it's the latest, basically. It's the the latest that uses even high TC materials in these Josephson uh, junctions. Thank you for the reference, Professor Saki. Uh, let me just quickly take you through the other questions and then uh, let's please, uh, students, we've already kept uh, Professor Saki here for a long time. So no problem. No problem. have any more questions, uh, I'll take you through whatever there is Thank and you. then let's stop. So very quickly, how do phonons exist in the barrier for the Josephson effect? Well, you know, the barrier has no condition for, there is no condition for superconductivity in the barrier. That's what's remarkable about the effect. So the conditions for superconductivity, they exist in the superconductors themselves, in the material. Let's say the material is aluminum. So you have superconducting aluminum. So in that uh, electrode, you have the vibrations, the lattice vibrations. And that helps to uh, uh, give uh, uh, an attraction between the electrons. But in the barrier, in the barrier, we don't have any conditions for superconductivity. And yet, Cooper pairs, they somehow find their way to pass through. Yeah, it's a purely quantum mechanical phenomenon. Exactly, exactly. Uh, okay, let's quickly go to the next question. 
is superconductivity is isn't superconductivity an intrinsic phenomenon to all materials no some materials are not superconductors even if you lower the temperature they are not superconducting so so there are only certain materials okay not all materials can be superconducting uh, another question uh, does the magnetic field is the magnetic field influenced due to the josephson effect basically like a back reaction maybe in your squid is the flux uh, you know also affected in turn by the josephson effect well the flux though or the external magnetic field the way it's used it's like a parameter that you can play with so that you control the uh, the uh, the uh, the josephson energy uh, which is the parameter of the junction now obviously if the magnetic field is huge okay then of course you can uh, the superconduct uh, the superconducting electrodes they they cannot expel it anymore okay so there is some critical value of this external magnetic field that we should not exceed otherwise we lose superconductivity in the electrodes themselves uh, um yeah so fine uh, just quickly is it possible to sandwich a thin insulator below 50 nanometers experimentally that's an experimental question i think you should read about this in the literature it's very hard to give you an answer to this uh, yeah in yeah, general I, it's it's a technical very highly technical question that only the experimentalists working on these systems would know yeah. you should look this up deeper uh, yeah. dhiman asked the question about the findings at isc where they were they reported that they had achieved high temperature superconductivity uh, what is actually causing it and the origin of it you might have heard of this process aki this yeah, yeah right so i think the the answer to this is not really known right yeah. now the mechanism is certainly not known and the people at isc themselves are still trying to stabilize what they saw back there yes. so they certainly saw it and they saw it in several samples uh -huh. however uh, making it reproducible at a large scale and to understand the physics better has proven to be a huge challenge, challenge. yes and yes. and therefore let's be patient with them and let's give them a chance yeah yes yes right uh, okay one last question and that's it students uh, from sohan can we use the junction barrier to store the cooper pairs like a super, like a capacitor for superconductivity so the in the josephson effect the guy in the middle can you use it to store cooper pairs uh, no no you need the uh, superconducting islands that's where you can put the pairs uh, so in the barrier they're simply transiting and they pass through yeah, they're like flowing through the barrier yes yes so it's just uh, temporary uh, uh, there yeah so you need a superconducting island to store them thank you professor saki it's been You're a very welcome. wonderful wonderful uh, this thing presentation not only have you taught us a lot of basic things you've oh, also Oh thank you so much you're very so modest many questions no no thank you've you so much. a lot of questions from us uh, indeed uh, let's everyone please unmute i request you all to unmute and just uh, raise your hands for a wonderful effort thank you very I much thank you thank you thank you for your I mean he's taken a lot of time thank you uh, sir thank you very much thank you yeah very uh, fine very well done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Prasanta. Thank you. So a deep thank you from all the students and, and myself, Prasanta. Thank you so much. Where are you? Uh, look, are you in Calcutta or? Uh... No, I. Uh, you mean you're asking me? Yes, please. Uh, uh, okay, Siddharth. Yeah. Siddharth. So, uh, sorry, Siddharth. Siddharth. Yes. Yeah. So uh, I uh, I'm at ISA Kolkata. I'm a colleague of Prasanta. Yes. And uh, I live. Uh, I don't live in the campus. I 